My name is Dr. Brendan McCarthy. I am the Chief Medical Officer of Protea Medical Center in Chandler, Arizona. Thank you so much for tuning into my podcast. Today, I wanted to talk to you about food allergies. <laughs> There's so much out there in the space, internet space, whatever, about the food allergy thing. And I want to talk to you a little bit from the past and, and work my way forward with it. I think I told this story a long time ago on an earlier podcast episode, a short part of it. I'm going to start with this one too, because it still sits with me. I remember I was in my, you know, mid twenties, early twenties, and uh, I was riding bikes. <laughs> so like I'm a, I was a teenager riding my bike around school. No, we were, I was riding my mountain bike with my friend, Brian. And I remember Brian and I were talking and he's like, yeah, I went to my doctor and she told me I had to stop eating bread and cheese and I can't do dairy anymore. So this season, I, I literally stopped. I said, what are you talking about? That's the staff of life. I was so outraged that Brian's doctor told him not to eat bread and cheese, which is like when you're young, when I was young, that's all we could afford, like bread. I was like, we, it's not a lot of money. You know, it's, so we were eating, <laughs> it's rough to hear that. And, and I remember how outraged I was and how much I thought that doctor was insane. And I was like, this is the worst medical advice I've ever heard. I'm not going to go to a doctor. That was my opinion. <laughs> and not that many years later, my tune has changed. Food allergies are a serious, serious, serious thing. Okay, let me start with that. It's very serious. And what I want to point out here is that by using food allergies, by eliminating food allergy exposure in my patients, by taking gluten out of someone's diet when they're gluten intolerant, I have seen miraculous changes in their health and I'm not exaggerating, not even a little bit. I've seen people with Sjogren's autoimmune disappear. Their antibodies disappear. I have seen lupus reverse. I have seen autoimmune thyroiditis reverse. I have seen amazing things in my life by eliminating certain things from people's diets. I, I really have. So I can tell you now beyond the shadow of a doubt that food allergies are very important. I remember very early on in my practice when I told a patient that I felt their symptoms were due to a food intolerance or food allergy, how much blowback I got from the patient, how much denial, and that's not possible. And I don't want to be that weird person at the table because that's another concern. No one wants to be that weird person at the table says, I can't eat that. You go over to someone's house having dinner and you don't want to be that weird person saying, I'm sorry, I won't eat that, you know? And there was so much resistance, not just from them, but from their other care providers, the rest of the medical industry. And I remember this in the early 2000s when I started practice, that they would just fight it. There's no such thing as a food intolerance like that. You don't have a food allergy. That's not possible. And they would fight it. The patients that I was able to get buy-in from, though, it changed their lives. I remember a woman who had gastroparesis. See, I'm like, gastroparesis is a, she had gastroparesis. I was just on a point here. We were talking about gastroparesis earlier. She had gastroparesis and she was on Reglin, which is not a great medicine. And I talked her into using a elimination diet. And that's the best way of finding out, which I'm going to explain this diet to you in a little bit. But I, I convinced her to give me a chance. And lo and behold, it was a gluten intolerance. And so fixed it. I've had patients have acne, horrible acne. And all it was at the end of the day, egg allergy. I've had people with eczema and a corn allergy. I've had case upon case upon case. And when they gave me buy in those years, I got change. They got better. And because of that hard work, that hard work on the part of the patient and me to push into this new area of medicine, which really isn't all that new, but it wasn't known very widely at the time, 
they got results where they were not before and their lives were changed for the better because they gave me that trust and they gave me that chance. When someone in your life has such a big change in their health and it's obvious and they are like, wow, what, what happened to you? Why are you so, you know, like, why are you better? What's changed? You know, these people getting better and better by eliminating their food allergy, taking it out of their diet, they get better and better. People started to realize, hey, these food allergy things are real, pretty, pretty good. It's pretty important. The catch is, though, that not every doctor believes in it. Not every doctor validates it. So you go to your doctor and say, hey, I may have a food allergy because I have these symptoms. I saw it help with my friend. I read about it online. And people just get dispelled. They just get like, yeah, that's not true. There's no such thing. That's not real. So then as the patient, you're stuck trying to figure out, like, what do I do? In my podcast, I talk about this a lot. When you're disenfranchised as a patient, when you have a valid health concern, say you have Sjogren's autoimmune, you know, like, you know, there's many different variations of it, you know, dry mouth, dry eyes, you know, whatever it is. And you know someone who hers was cured through diet and you want to have yours figured out that way. And you go to your doctor, your doctor's like, that's crazy talk. That doesn't work. Where does that leave you? Now, if you went to your friend's doctor, you could see that doctor. But what if this friend's in another part of the country or in another country entirely? I have a patient, she was from Iceland, and she's the one I'm thinking about with Sjogren's. Very early on in my practice, she had Sjogren's. We found the lab, saw Sjogren's, eliminated gluten was hers, eliminated gluten from her diet, Sjogren antibodies went away. She's from Iceland, she lived in the States. All the people that she knew in Iceland, she told this whole story and they were like, oh my gosh, but no one over there could get a doctor to help them figure it out. So these people are being disenfranchised by their medical care, the care providers that they have. They're being invalidated. So what happens then? That's when bad things happen. When we're desperate and we have something wrong with us that's falling between the cracks, it's not being adequately cared about or, or monitored or, or diagnosed, and we feel that our doctors are not giving us that space, what do we do? We go try and figure it out ourselves. So then enter into the internet now, and you're worried about this food intolerance thing you may have causing an autoimmune condition. You know, you, you, you worry about this food intolerance causing your skin to break out. You worry about this food intolerance for your rash and your eczema worried and your worry is valid and you got nowhere to go. So what do you do? You go to the internet. When you're desperate, there are a lot of bad people who want to make money. I've said it before. I'll say it again. When you're not well, what won't you pay to become better? If you have autoimmune condition like Sjogren's or rheumatoid arthritis or lupus, and, and, and there's a chance this might be helping you, what won't you spend to try and figure that out? So you'll have unethical players step in in those moments and try and sell you something. And that happens a lot. So when someone thinks they have a food allergy, they go to their doctor, they get blown off. You don't have a food allergy, you're fine. You know, bye. Then they go online, what do they find? What's out there? And these are these blood tests you got right? People go and they get these skin prick tests and they test them for food allergies that way. This is the thing. And I'm going to, I told Justin, I don't want to be too biochemical, but I got to be a little biochemical on this. There's two types of things here going on with food allergies. And I shouldn't even be using the word food allergy. I should be using intolerance. I'm just saying allergy, intolerance, whatever. You do eat something, you're not doing well with it. Can we say that? Yes. I'm not being too scientific with that one. There's a food allergy when you eat something, you have an immediate response. You release histamines right away. That could be something like your skin breaks out, you have a rash, you can have anaphylaxis. Wide range of things happen right away when you eat it. It's an immediate reaction, okay? That's IgE-mediated. 
I can run a lab on IgEs and find out that sensitivity, no problem. That's the allergy that all doctors believe in. It's the other ones they don't believe in. There's four aspects of the immune system involved in here. I'm not going to get too in-depth with it. I'm going to say this, though. There's immunoglobulin G, immunoglobulin M, immunoglobulin A. All these ones play a role in your immune system. And there's non-immune-mediated intolerance as well. So in that area of soup, that's not the type of allergy where you eat it and have an immediate response. There's this other versions where you eat something and you don't react for maybe 24 hours. So say you're sensitive to gluten and it's not immunoglobulin E mediated. So there's no histamine being released. You eat the gluten. You don't have any symptoms for 24 hours sometimes. Your doctor listens to you talking and is like, well, it's not like you just ate peanuts and had anaphylaxis. I don't see how this is a food allergy. When your immune system reacts to something in a non-classical way, often you are left to your own to figure it out because your doctors will invalidate it. So you go online and you'll have all these companies who will start selling you these labs you can do at home to test to see if you have a sensitivity to it. The problem with these tests are they're not always accurate. The lab is not always accurate. Sometimes the lab will tell you that you're not sensitive to that food, but you actually are. And sometimes they'll tell you you are sensitive to the food and you're not because they're not accurate. Sometimes they are. Sometimes we need to use them. But I want you to know it's not all the time. Sometimes these labs are the worst thing we can do. While that lab is not always accurate at the results, it's always accurate in charging you for the test. So you go and you spend your money and you throw your money out and you got results that may or may not be accurate and you're going to base your health on that. That's not always the best thing to do. Sometimes I do use those tests, not always, rarely, but I'll use it in certain circumstances and in certain settings with certain goals. In other words, it's highly um, specific to the individual but it's not my first choice. When someone has a food allergy, and I'm suspicious of that being a food allergy, I'll see certain labs point me in that direction, certain symptoms point me in that direction. I will do an elimination reintroduction diet. An elimination reintroduction diet is the best gold standard for figuring out what's wrong with you and your reactions to foods. So what you do is you go for two weeks to three weeks, two weeks is better, by eliminating the foods out of your diet that are the most common food allergens or something you eat a lot of. So the most common things we eliminate in our practice are wheat, corn, dairy, soy, eggs, tomatoes, the whole Solanacea food group, the nightshades, tomatoes, potatoes, eggplant, bell pepper, cayenne pepper, chili pepper, paprika. We take all these out. We take all the primary allergens out of someone's diet for two weeks and we monitor them. At the end of two weeks, we slowly reintroduce the foods one at a time. What that does is it sets the stage for the body first to detoxify off of that food they're sensitive to. And during the process of detoxification of the body, the immune system finally comes back down to a calm state. So a lot of times if I'm using lab work, sometimes I'll use an inflammatory marker in their, their labs to verify that they have a food allergy. I'll run that lab to make sure that inflammatory marker came down. That'll confirm that I'm onto something with this being a food allergy. And then I have them slowly reintroduce the food, reintroduce the foods one at a time every other day and watch for symptoms. By taking that time off and then reintroducing it later, you give the body enough time and space to give you a very clear message that you're sensitive to that food and you'll know it. So say you eliminate all these foods out and then the first thing you introduce is going to be say milk. Okay. Cause you want to test your dairy. So you have a glass of milk for breakfast, for lunch and for dinner. Something that simple. And you watch for symptoms. It could be gastrointestinal. It could be your joints. It could be your skin. It could be your allergies. And, you know, sinuses, that's a, any number of different things. But that is the gold standard. That is the best way of finding out if there's a food you're intolerant to is doing that reintroduction elimination. Elimination, excuse me. Elimination reintroduction. Sometimes that diet is brutal. Having someone take uh, um, wheat, dairy, corn, soy, eggs, tomatoes, t- sugar, nuts, sesame seeds, all these things, taking these things out of someone's diet, that's not easy. 
Sometimes I have to do versions of that. I have to adjust it down a little bit and do little pieces of it at a time, take only a couple things out at once and try that out. We make that exception for these patients. We work with them to get the best protocol we can. It's not easy to eliminate all these foods at once, but it's the best. It's frustrating to me as a physician to know that people will go online and buy a food allergy panel from some company that doesn't always give them accurate results. And then they spend their life trying to avoid a food that they may not be sensitive to, or they're eating food that they are sensitive to because the results were inaccurate. I feel like it takes advantage of you as a patient because you're spending, you know, a couple hundred bucks for a lab and you didn't get really good results. The method I just described, the elimination reintroduction diet, that's free. There's no charge. You just do it. And if it's too hard to do all the foods at once, what do you do? You break it down into little pieces and do that one at a time. Please remember that you are so vulnerable when you are in a medical state that is not respected or regarded by the current medical system as it practices because you have something going on that's affecting your health and it's being ignored or outright denied as being real. And then all you got left now is people on the fringe who want to charge you money to figure it out. And that's like the old saying between the devil and the deep blue sea, you don't really have a good place to be. Please know that even when you feel that way, when you're trapped between a bad decision and a worse decision, often there's a third pathway you don't even know about yet. Have hope. If you believe you have a food allergy, try an elimination diet. Give it a shot. See your body responds to it. There's so many of these things posted online that are hard to find. Just two weeks, no wheat, dairy, corn, soy, eggs, tomatoes, sugar, caffeine. Sometimes I'll pull coffee out of people's diets. Okay, I will. <laughs> Tree nuts, seeds, sesame seeds. Take those out of your diet. That's how you feel. If you have Sjogren's or if you have a lupus or if you're an autoimmune condition, run the antibodies before you start the elimination diet and run the antibodies after you finish the elimination diet and see what happened. Then reintroduce the foods one at a time every other day and see what it did to you. See if you react to it. See what your labs look like. I hope this helps. Please like, share, and subscribe. Your comments mean everything to us because it helps us drive the content of this podcast. So please do give us a comment. Until then, I will see you next time.